Welcome everyone to the 2020 annual meeting of the American Council of Learned Societies. First, I wanna thank you all for joining us, especially now in the midst of closing out the academic year and a global pandemic. And we truly prize your gift of time and attention in this unusual, but also now quite familiar to us meeting venue. The work that you do in your roles as scholars, as teachers, as mentors, administrators, society directors, board members and staff, or some mixture of all of these roles is crucial to our collective mission. So again, thank you. I also thank our chair, Bill Kirby, and all his colleagues on the ACLS board for giving me the opportunity to serve humanistic studies in this role. Who could have predicted, certainly not me, one year ago this week, as I prepared to talk at this meeting with my wonderful predecessor, Pauline Yu, that I would be speaking with you today, not in Baltimore, where we plan to meet, but from my living room on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. I'm grateful to Pauline and Steve Wheatley, too, for their constant support and advice. When Pauline and I spoke before this group last spring, she invited me to meet you, uh, meet you all, by talking about who and what was on my mind as I prepared to move from the CUNY Graduate Center, where I was then serving as interim president, to ACLS. My answer was, great faculty and institutions working with limited resources. The societies so valuable as one of the only ways scholars connect across schools. The challenge of serving both scholars engaged in public facing research and curiosity driven scholars working on topics without immediate public relevance. And the importance of listening to and working with the next generation and diverse voices who have not historically had the place they deserve at the planning table. I'm thinking here of graduate students, scholars of color, first generation scholars, faculty on the front lines of teaching most of the nation's college students. I was eager to join ACLS because along with supporting scholars and sustaining the societies, the council has a longstanding and exciting role in fostering collaborative action for positive change in the academy, especially in the United States, but also around the world. Throughout its history, it's encouraged academics to respond actively to social conflict and community needs. One of the first questions ACLS entertained in the 1920s, alas, without making much significant progress, was the development of a single international language. A lot more successful was the Council's work on area studies, including Asian and Latin American studies, and what we now call African American studies, all of which were on the Council's agenda in the 1930s and 1940s. Cultivating strong relationships between college professors and secondary school teachers was a significant issue for the Council in the wake of the GI Bill, and again, under Stan Katz's presidency in the 1990s. Given all the talk out there about the future of work, ACLS has always seemed to me ideally placed to envision the future of scholarly work. Anchoring that as yet uncharted future is work that successfully captures the interest of the next generation of students and the curious public. This work, I think, will appear in proliferating forms and styles in years to come. It already does so. This work will be collaborative and accessible. It will be produced in an ever-growing number of spaces, both inside and outside colleges and universities. And this is an important point I wanna stress as the academy defines itself more broadly and inclusively. This work of advancing humanistic knowledge and creating and circulating it will be done in continuing education ventures and public libraries, in art collectives and experimental humanities labs, in museums and courses of study mounted totally online. Right now, thanks partly to where I am, thanks to COVID-19, everything feels very different. But my thinking that I've just shared with you from a year ago remains much the same. Since last July, I've been grateful to work with colleagues at ACLS and beyond around the country and around the world who have joined in planning what I think of as our humanistic action action on behalf of humanistic scholars and scholarship that is itself humanistic in design and implementation. Humanistic action, as I see it, is based on a commitment to clear reasoning, to justice, to self-awareness, a sense of obligation to others, 
to seeing matters in a dialogical and historically informed way and from different standpoints. So to ensure a humanistic approach to planning the start of our second century, our first priority was to learn from as many different people and as many different constituencies as possible. We pursued two tracks that I think of being a scholar of Cicero in, in Ciceronian terms, research on the one hand and dialogue on the other. This means we did a lot of reading in the ACLS archives and we did a lot of listening and talking. Thanks to the generosity of the Mellon Foundation, ACLS hosted three second century conversation groups this winter, bringing together faculty and administrators with a reputation for fresh thinking about higher education. John Darms, president of ACLS in the 90s, convened similar planning conversations. And from what I've read of his notes, both of us benefited enormously from the company of interlocutors who were provocative and inspiring. ACLS also held centennial conversations, as we called them, across the country with faculty, students, administrators, in, and supporters in large and small groups. And that spurred an enormous number of useful follow-up exchanges. I made visits or calls with all our consortium representatives and deans and drew very heavily on the friendly generosity of people at a range of schools. Time doesn't permit me to review all those meetings or acknowledge and thank everyone involved, but I will mention an unforgettable week, a week-long road, road trip I took with ACLS Chief of Staff Kelly Buttermore to visit the University of West Alabama and Central Arkansas University, where we learned from and were moved by students and faculty alike and built relationships we trust will last for years to come. We asked everyone we talked to for insight on three questions. First, we asked, for the past 20 years, ACLS has concentrated on individual research fellowships, but what other projects and programs would you be interested in having us support? Second, we asked, what are the most promising directions in humanistic research that you see, and what is the special role of PhD programs in advancing these new directions? And finally, we asked, given that ACLS has a distinguished history of advocacy, what are the issues you think would benefit from our intervention now? And why do you believe that ACLS is the right vehicle for this work? Out of the answers came our verbs of humanistic action that you see in the strategic plan we shared yesterday. This is the Venn diagram of what our interlocutors told us was needed and what they believed we could do and should do. We support, connect, amplify, and renew. We support, above all, scholars and scholarship. Now, this is a very generous mandate, but in a world where excellence is distributed widely, but resources are ever more constrained, our strategic plan upholds the principle that, whenever possible, our grant making should advance structural change for the good in the academy. And this is a time of widespread need, and our fellowships and grants will help support those scholars the academy of the future needs most. We're working right now to develop a program of support for new and recent PhDs who have navigated a punishing job market in, in academia since 2008 and who must now face the consequences of COVID-19. This program will seek to sustain those most vulnerable to external shocks like the pandemic, lecturers, adjuncts, and visiting assistant professors, scholars of color still too few in every field, junior faculty who have had to turn on a dime to teach online while trying to finish projects on the tenure clock. I venture to bet that everyone in this meeting knows or knows of brilliant scholars whose teaching and service obligations prevent them from applying for year-long fellowships. We're also devising flexible grants to support outstanding research active faculty who teach in places like regional comprehensive institutions, which I think of as the backbone of this country's system of higher education. We're gonna keep up constant dialogue so that we craft programs that meet the needs on the ground. But turning our attention to these groups, we think, is not just the right thing to do. We think that institutions and humanistic fields of study will benefit in countless ways from this action. Many people we spoke with over the past year expressed the hope that our recognition of the traditional measures of scholarly accomplishment and promotion that were developed over a century ago, especially the book and the article, will expand to include other modes of knowledge circulation that draw on technology and the changing habits of learners in the 21st century. As a trusted arbiter of scholarly excellence, ACLS has the exciting duty to work with our peer reviewers to spotlight scholars who find 
the most ingenious ways to spark the interest of students and the public. The diversity of scholarly curiosity and styles makes it impossible, of course, to hold up any single ideal. But Hannah Arendt, in my a scholar I work on, a thinker I work on, rather playfully gets at the essence of, of this, in my view, when she praises the capacities of what she calls the enlarged mentality, saying that to think with an enlarged mentality means that one trains one's imagination to go visiting. We will promote an inclusive definition of what counts as scholarly production, seeking scholars who are imaginative and adventurous, who go visiting, as Arendt puts it. Our second humanistic action, we connect people. This is no mean job, especially given the data I think about every night as I go to sleep and which greets me every morning. There are over 3,000 four-year institutions of higher education in the United States alone and nearly 1,500 community colleges. Academia in this country exists in a state of competitive fragmentation. In good times, it's a huge and gloriously chaotic Rube Goldberg machine of learning and study with many pathways in and countless projects ticking away in various stages of construction. In times of emergency like this one, the machine's pieces tend to find themselves in a state of friction, banging against each other, competing for tuition dollars and rankings. So we see our gatherings as alliance building forces, important opportunities to tackle longstanding problems in the academy together, thereby strengthening the infrastructure in which humanistic scholarship can thrive. Thanks to a new grant from the Mellon Foundation, we'll bring together in three years of summer institutes three groups that don't gather naturally, representatives of the learned societies, administrators and faculty leaders, and to my mind, the most important group because their voices are rarely heard from in, in these contexts, students from underrepresented minorities, recent PhDs in the same group, and young activist scholars. Together, we'll discuss how to make real our common vision of a just, equitable academy. In the near future, we plan to convene at least two more groups. One will gather librarians and scholars and university leaders to work up best practices for sustaining digital resources. Another will invite academics together with non-academics and funders to do an exercise, we hope, in design thinking. We want to ask, what do we want the Academy of the Future and humanistic studies in particular to look like? Imagine we had no PhD programs in the humanities at all. How might we design them from the ground up? We're focusing here on doctoral reform as the linchpin of change because it's in this stage, of course, as we all know, that future academic habits and values are formed. The philosopher Hans Gadamer famously points out in Truth and Method that, and I quote, every conversation creates a common language. To reach an understanding in a dialogue is not merely a matter of putting oneself forward and successfully asserting one's own point of view, but of being transformed into a communion in which we do not remain what we were. Recent years have seen leading scholars start venturesome conversations outside the academy, in prisons, work with veterans in high schools, and collaborative community-based research. Our loose ACLS fellowships in religion, journalism, and international affairs sustain this effort by assisting scholars crossover writing for broad public audiences. Our Mellon-funded Scholars and Society program places faculty for a year in nonprofit organizations, many of them doing work devoted to social progress and reform. And our Mellon Public Fellows program supports new PhDs seeking to bring humanistic values and skills to work outside the academy long term. Like the dialogues that Gadamer describes, these encounters are transformative for the scholars themselves. They emerge from their work outside the academy with new perspectives and often new research questions. We believe strongly at ACLS in the value humanists bring to public spaces and public discourse. Our third humanistic action is to amplify humanistic work in the public eye, to amplify the work of those scholars who have been transformed and had their thinking transformed by contact with the public. To carry this forward, we'll use some familiar methods like public seminars and events, hopefully in person as the time comes. But we believe there's even more long-term value in nurturing scholars whose thinking is already amplified or enlarged, as Hannah Arendt might say, by their attunement to public interests, curiosities, and needs. 
And at the same time, we must also ensure that the reward system of academia recognizes and celebrates these accomplishments. As I look at the decline of undergraduate majors in the humanities and humanistic social sciences around the country, I see publicly engaged scholars transformative engagement with the world outside as a powerful key to making humanistic studies more visible on campus and attracting larger numbers of students. Whether they are art historians or philosophers or classicists or you name it, we will seek ways to help scholars treat the walls of the academy as permeable barriers on the model of Hannah Arendt or W.E.B. Du Bois. We'll do this, and this is a hugely important point, not by compelling scholars to limit their research questions to immediately urgent public issues, although we will support scholars who work in those areas, but we'll do this by encouraging scholars to tackle big questions, to articulate clearly the value of the curiosities they're pursuing and to make it a priority to reclaim their due place in public discourse by finding fellow travelers in the vast human crowd outside campus whose curiosities are vast and diverse. Current conditions, I think, may unexpectedly nudge scholars faster down this path. In the wake of COVID-19, college instructors all over the country are, have had no choice but to experiment with new ways of communicating like this over Zoom with their students and colleagues. We're finding ourselves exploring a vast world online with new opportunities to find and share texts and artifacts, to get to know students and colleagues, sometimes in their living rooms and kitchens, to become adept in visual media, and to see just how many sources of bad and good information exist out there. From the conversations I've had recently, young scholars in particular will not view the circulation of scholarly knowledge or their role as teachers and scholars in quite the same way as before, once this immediate crisis is over. It's our job to help figure out the new shape of scholarly work in collaboration with them. Finally, then, we renew, we review, and we try to reinvigorate ourselves and you, our partners in the learned societies and colleges and universities. This spring is a historically unprecedented time, as I hardly need say. It's a time of illness, and hope of mourning and relief. It's prompting many people to ask what kind of world we want on the other side of this pandemic. We have a chance right now in the academy to ask what we love most, what we most wanna preserve, and what obstacles we see to the academy we want. I start from my belief that scholarship itself is a profound act of human love not love of wisdom in the abstract sense in the Greek word philosophia, or at least not only that. I think when a scholar directs attention to a poet who died 2000 years ago, or to a painting made on the other side of the world, or to the understanding the economic structure of a society long gone, that scholar may be doing archival or critical or interpretive work, but they're also doing the work of remembrance, commemoration, which is the work of love. Love of humanity anchors the core humanistic action of scholarship, the effort to preserve and understand the marvelous particularity and plurality of humans and the things and ideas that we create. I must move to a close and I'm happy to take questions for a few minutes. I should end by assuring you that most of our work is not conducted in the grand and earnest language I just used. But I think as we prepare to dive right now into the everyday practices of board election and budget approval, and my reminding you to familiarize yourselves with our new strategic plan, it's also worth remembering the truly grand purpose that drives our community. Thank you again for your attention. <laughs>